Hey, good morning, everyone. It is Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to the dads that might be watching this. Happy Father's Day to those that are operating in a role as a father, even if you think you're not. And also happy Father's Day to all of our small group leaders uh, that might be seeing this. So just a reminder, today we are not meeting on Zoom. So we are in the weekend of Father's Day, not meeting on Zoom. So do not look for your Zoom groups. Go spend time with dad, go mow the yard, go wash, their, wash his vehicle, do whatever it is that your dad likes. Make him a cup of coffee, make him breakfast. I don't know, figure it out, take him fishing, who knows? So here's what we got going on at the church. Just another quick update. So basically what we've got going on is we've got some stuff in the auditorium. We've already cleared out most of the coffee shop and moved everything pretty much back in the auditorium, got the camera set up. Guys are working today and doing cable stuff. And so, so we're gonna keep working on that stuff and getting rolling out to getting to where we can actually be back at church. Imagine that actually being back in the building. That's super exciting. We're getting there. So we're looking at either the end of June, beginning of July. So somewhere right in there, don't worry, you don't have to wait all the way till August, but just know we have those things coming up ahead. So if you weren't here last week and you missed the video, go back and watch the video from last week. But what we were talking about last week is we were talking about the life of Joseph and we started off by really kind of summing up and encapsulating what does it look like when it comes to family dynamics and stuff like that. And so we were talking about Joseph's dream. So you can go back to that and watch that in the video. But I hope you all have a great Father's Day. Enjoy your time together. Week two of what to do when you don't know what to do. So when you don't know how to do something, how to fix something or how something works, what do you do? Ask a teacher? Ask your parents? Ask your friends? Ask someone you really know and trust? No, you go to the internet and ask some randos. But I'm not talking about creeps here, I hope. No, I mean the people of the internet. You know, those people who make how-to videos. Because chances are, if you're trying to figure out something, someone on the internet has already figured it out for you. Things like, how do I unsend a text? No. How do I do a winged eyeliner? How do I get rid of the zit by Friday night? How do I get out of gym class? How do I screen cap Snapchat without getting caught? I'll never know. But then there are things in life that don't have an easy fix, that don't have a simple solution, that don't have a how-to video. Things like what to do when you have problems with family, or when it seems like you have no control in your life, or what to do when someone has done something to you. I mean, clearly, they gotta go. The truth is, there's a lot of life that doesn't have a solution you can just find online. So how do you know what to do when you don't know what to do? How many of you overuse emojis when you text? Actually, scratch that. How many of you would say that there's no such thing as overusing emojis? I bet some of you can maintain an entire text thread only using emojis and your friends would know exactly what you're talking about. Here's some of my personal favorite emojis in the world. First, laughing tear face. I use this one all the time. Sometimes I like to mix things up using the laughing cat tear face, which really sounds weird when you say it out loud. When my friends and I send each other dumb gifts, a lot of laughing tear faces are sent in response. I also like the green face. Maybe I'm overly sensitive to smells, but I tend to use it a lot. Like I'll give you a couple examples. If my friend texts me, just change the diaper. Ugh, insert green face. Just walk into the locker room at my gym. Ugh, insert green face. Just took my shoes off. Ugh, insert green face. And finally, the sad face with the tears streaming down. Whether I'm sad about something serious or something lighthearted, this emoji is sure to follow. Like when my friend texts me on Sunday and says, just drove through the Chick-fil-A line and I realized it's Sunday. That one gets a lot of sad faces with tears streaming down. And that's the beauty of emojis. They help us talk about how we feel without using a lot of words. On the other hand, there are a few emojis that I don't use as often. But when I do, I think they pack a punch and they say a little bit more than my usual go-tos. I like the first one the best, the face without a mouth, because it represents those moments where you simply have no words to say. I use when I hear about something or when something happens that I just can't make sense of. 
I'd say that most of the time, these shocked emojis are sent along with a text message that reports something happening that was shocking in a bad way. Something that catches us off guard and hits us out of nowhere. These things don't happen every day, but when they do, they can affect us in a big way. Have you ever experienced anything in your life like that? Something that simply rocked your world, caught you off guard, made you feel uncertain, or caused you a lot of hurt? Maybe you felt this way when you got the news your parents were splitting up, even though you had no idea things were that bad. Maybe a friend had something hurtful to say about you, and he or she accidentally sent that text to you, and you immediately knew that they meant to send it to someone else. Maybe you felt this way when your mom or dad told your family that you were going to have to move because of a job change. Maybe you felt this way when you experienced an injury at the beginning of your sports season, or maybe your boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with you over text. Maybe you got a rejection letter from the college you were dreaming of attending. Unfortunately, this list could go on for a while with examples of times when your world was rocked by some shocking news or circumstances. If you haven't experienced it yet, there'll be a time in your life when this happens. The thing about these shockingly painful moments is that they often hit us out of nowhere. Because of that, it's difficult for us to know how they'll make us feel. And because of that, it's difficult for us to know how we'll respond. Sometimes we're surprised by how well we handle it. We think, wow, I figured that news like this would take me to the edge, but I'm actually okay. Sometimes we surprise ourselves by how much it tears us apart. We think, I don't even know why I'm so upset, but I am a mess. Sometimes we consider, where is God in all of this? Because we're all wired differently, we experience hurt differently. But that doesn't change the fact that hurt hurts. That's the bad news. The good news is that we're going back to the life of Joseph as a model for how to handle unexpected pain. Joseph is one of the most famous people in the Old Testament of the Bible. Joseph had some family drama, drama that he definitely played a part in creating. He was his dad's favorite child and therefore given special treatment compared to his brothers. And on top of that, he had a dream that his brothers and even his parents bowed down to him out of respect and honor. And because Joseph seemed to have a hard time picking up on social cues, he shared his dream with his family. You can imagine how well that went. His brothers were not okay with him being his dad's favorite. His brothers were not okay with him sharing his dreams of ruling over them. So how did they respond? Check this out. But they saw him in the distance and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. That escalated quickly and it gets worse. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Despite his anger toward Joseph, one of his brothers actually had a conscience in the moment. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. Thank goodness for Reuben. He convinced his brothers to throw Joseph into a well instead of going homicidal on him. He even planned on coming back to rescue Joseph later. The brothers listened to Reuben, and when Joseph approached, they ripped off the special coat his father had given him, and they threw him in a well. If Joseph had a phone, this is when he would text his best friend. <laughs> when your brothers tear off your jacket and throw you into a well, SMH, shock face. But they still are not done with him. They notice a caravan of traders approaching. Judah, another one of Joseph's many brothers, suggests that they sell Joseph to these traders. After all, selling Joseph to a group of people who would most likely make him a slave is much better than murdering him, right? So that's exactly what they do. They dip Joseph's coat into, they, so that's exactly what they do. They dip Joseph's coat in the blood of a wild animal and they take it to their father and tell him that Joseph was likely attacked and killed by an animal. What a cover story. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. That last line tells us everything we need to know about the situation. The brothers obviously knew that the coat belonged to Joseph. They brought it up to let their dad know that they noticed the way he favored Joseph. 
and they were mad about it. They didn't call it Joseph's robe or our brother's robe. They said, your son's robe. What a bunch of jealous jerks. This is where Joseph would probably be texting again. Good news, my brothers pulled me out of the well. Bad news, they sold me to some traders who are now taking me out of town. I am not in a good place, shot face. I'm being a bit lighthearted, but there was nothing lighthearted about the situation. We simply can't imagine the fear, despair, uncertainty, anger, and hurt that he felt, betrayed by his own flesh and blood, sold into slavery by the brothers he grew up with. The message being sent was loud and clear. We are all better off without you. This was clearly a what to do when you don't know what to do moment. Our stories are different than Joseph's, but we'll all experience pain of some kind. We'll have painful moments that catch us off guard. We'll have moments when life doesn't make sense and we don't have the words to process what's happening. Unfortunately for Joseph, he had more shocking moments in his future. We'll look at some of those in the next few weeks, but I wanna highlight five powerful words that show up in his life. The Lord was with Joseph. You see, when Joseph was in despair and wondering how life would turn out, he could rely on the truth that God was with him. This truth didn't change the reality of Joseph's situation, but there was comfort in knowing that he wasn't alone. This truth didn't mean that Joseph could see where the story was going, but he could know that God was with him. This truth didn't mean that Joseph could easily deal with the things that happened to him. It didn't mean that he had a reason or explanation for the pain in his life, but he didn't have to figure out those things all by himself. And the same is true for us. When there is nothing you can do, God is with you. When life hands you shocking news and you don't know what to do, God is with you. When you and I can truly understand and embrace this truth, it changes things. Our circumstances may not change. After all, Joseph wasn't immediately returned to his parents, but it changes our perspective on our pain. It changes how we see what we're going through. Knowing that God is with us may not change our circumstances, but it might just change us. It might just give us enough hope to keep going, even in the midst of hopeless situations. It's easy to give in to the hurt we've experienced. It's easy to let fear overwhelm us or anger consume us. We have a lot of reasons to let difficult and sometimes unfair situations get the last word. But when we know that God is with us, the uncertainty of life doesn't get the last word. God does. But what does that look like for us? There are no formulas or easy answers for getting through hard times, but here are some things to do in the meantime. First, be real. Feel your feelings. Not everyone will experience incredible luck in life, but everyone will go through tough times and pain. All throughout the Bible, people went through difficulties, and there were many accounts of them being real and honest with God about their struggles. There are no cliches to make the hard times go away, and our job isn't to just suck it up and act like everything's okay. If we believe that God is with us, then we should know that God is more than okay with our honest questions, doubts, and fears. Second, remind yourself that God is with you. Here's a spoiler alert. Things did eventually work out for Joseph but we know that because we can read the whole story in the Bible. But when Joseph was in it, he didn't know how it would turn out. There were no spoiler alerts for him. All he could do is face another day wondering how things would turn out. But he held on to one thing, that God was with him. In moments when life is toughest, that's when this reminder is most important. God is with you and your story isn't over yet. Our life will be full of moments where we don't know what to do about our pain. We'll want to insert the shock face emoji a lot of times. In those moments, it's important to know that when you don't know what to do, God is with you. And we know that God is with you and for you, it will give you the hope when things feel hopeless. It won't make the difficult circumstances go away, but you'll have something to count on. You will know that you are not alone. All right, everybody. So the bottom line for this week is when there's nothing you can do, God is with you. So you just heard that with the story of Joseph and what he went through. And it was just horrible what his brothers did to him. But God is with him. And what we're going to continue to read about and learn about 
over the next few weeks is how God is continuing to be with Joseph. And the same thing with us being at home or with you and where you're at right now is anytime you doubt that God is with you, he is always with you. And if you are a follower of Christ, he dwells within you. So that's something to be excited about. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for how you work and how you move. And Lord, how a story like Joseph's, where even with the horrible things that happened and, and him being sold into slavery and the way that his family treated him, Lord, that you had a bigger plan and you had a greater plan that was in place. And that as we move on for the next few weeks, that we get to understand and see that. And Lord, we pray for fathers today that they have a great Father's Day. Lord, that they continue to pour into their kids and Lord, that they continue to be leaders in their home. And Lord, we pray for our students and our leaders, Lord, that as they're navigating through what's going on and in, in just uh, social distancing and even things that are happening in the world, Lord, that we are reminded always that you are with us. So Lord, we just thank you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a great week.